Hi, I'm Dr. Bardia Amvar of the Skilled Wound Care Surgical Program. In this video, I'm going to be discussing some of the myths around bedside surgical debridement. The first thing I'd like to explain is the reason as to why we would perform a surgical debridement on a wound. Most specifically, we perform debridements on chronic wounds versus acute wounds. Acute wounds occur when there is a minor trauma to the skin, breaking the skin and going down to either subcutaneous or deeper tissues. However, acute wounds follow an orderly and standard fashion of healing going through all of the wound healing phases without any impediments. In a chronic wound, you can see multiple impediments to wound healing, like the wound you see below. In this wound, there is infected tissue. The peri wound is broken down and both macerated and rolled over requiring multiple debridements in order for the wound to get into the healing phase and hopefully epithelialize or close. If you look at to the wound to my right, you might look at it and say, wow, this wound is infected, and it is. Sometimes we perform debridements when wounds are actually infected. Some may believe, and this is one of the myths I'd like to dispel, is that a debridement can actually cause a wound to become infected. This is a rare circumstance. If you're using sterile instruments and you're performing standard protocols and procedures, you're actually going to be removing a lot of infection from the wound base and the wound itself to prevent further worsening possible sepsis. And in this patient, because they have a lower extremity wound, as a result of peripheral arterial disease, you're actually going to be preventing an amputation in the patient's lower extremity. And this is why we perform debridements on a lot of wounds that are infected. If you look at the healing on this wound, you could see that as we remove more and more of this devitalized, unhealthy tissue, getting down to good wound healing tissue, which is usually bleeding tissue or granulation tissue, we start to see some healing. So even in the most challenging circumstances like this wound, which actually was recommended for the patient to have an amputation, we were actually able to epithelialize or close this wound over multiple surgical debridement sessions for this wound and the wound actually epithelialized to a very small uh, wound base and this was an excellent result for this patient. So debridements really do not cause infections. They can cause a transient bacteremia if you perform a debridement and some of the bacteria may spread into the patient's bloodstream. This is very rare and this would be demonstrated clinically by the patient having a fever immediately after the debridement, usually an hour or two after the debridement, and it may last up to six hours. And this is due to the bacteria spreading, spreading into the bloodstream. If the patient has a healthy immune system, this will normally not occur, but in certain cases we may need to give the patient antibiotics if the fever persists to kill the bacteria within the patient's bloodstream. But this is a rare circumstance, and this is a rare complication of a debridement. In most cases, the debridement is actually going to be helping prevent infections uh, for a patient and in the wound. So why are we performing these debridements on these, on these wounds? Once again, we're performing the debridement to remove dead tissue, which is devitalized, devitalized tissue. This could be in the form of slough or necrosis, like we see in this debridement here. Much of that slough and necrotic tissue is covered in bacteria and dead cells are within the wound, which are known as senescent cells. So we're also debriding and removing a lot of the cells that are no longer functioning properly. And also by doing the debridement, we're removing drainage from the wound because the infected tissue will no longer be draining, heavily soaking the actual dressings of the patient. And we're also removing biofilm. Biofilm is a buildup of bacteria over the tissue or layers on top of the wound. And biofilm can exist in wounds that actually look healthy and granulating. The next thing that I'd like to dispel is that wound bleeding is bad. We actually perform a debridement to get down to healthy bleeding tissue. So some bleeding after a debridement is good. We don't want to see profuse bleeding, but we want to get down to the tissue that's bleeding. That's how we know that the tissue is actually alive if it bleeds. If the tissue typically doesn't bleed, it's probably not living tissue and we haven't debrided down to the level that we want to debride down to. So sometimes you're going to see a debridement and you're going to see some bleeding in the wound. And for some people, this may be a little bit jarring, maybe like, whoa, I see bleeding in the wound, but this is okay. This is where we want to be in terms of the debridement. We want to get down to the bleeding tissue, which is really, really healthy.
The next question we often get is, how often should we debride? In our practice, we performed a retrospective study, and it was published in July of 2017 in the journal Wounds, where we looked at multiple uh, repetitive visits for patients, specifically how often patients who were seen over a prolonged period of time required debridements. So in our study, we examined patients who had wounds on the sacral coccyx, coccyx, ischial tuberosity, or trochanteric regions, and we looked at how often did these patients actually were they seen. And only 10% of the time were these patients seen uh, greater than eight times. In most cases, 90% patients were seen less than eight times. And this is an excellent result because we found that the patients were doing very well. So only 10% of the time were the patients seen more often than eight times. In that time frame, we also looked and we also looked to see how often did these patients have wounds. And about most, in about half of the patients we saw, they had more than two wounds. So a lot of the patients we see who have chronic wounds may have actually more than two wounds who need chronic management for their wounds. And what we also found was that only about 5% of the patients that we saw needed long-term debridements greater than eight weeks. So 95% of patients will not need debridements over and over and over again. And then finally, what we saw was that in the wound healing period of those patients that were debrided, in the first month, the wound actually got 25% smaller. In the second month, the wound actually got 33% smaller. And in the third month, about 40%. Now, about 25% of patients did have no response. Now, what we have to understand about wound debridement is that it is not always a cure. Sometimes we're performing wound debridements only to prevent wound infections, worsening, to prevent a very um, profuse smell. Uh, some, there's many, many different reasons. Sometimes we only perform a debridement to prevent an amputation and the wound may not get smaller. And sometimes when we perform debridements, wounds may actually get bigger because the wounds may progress. This does not mean that the debridement is not working. The debridement is there to prevent further decline, hospitalization, possible amputation, death, or really bad infection known as sepsis. So debridement is a critical tool to healing chronic wounds that we see in the long-term care setting. Thank you.